Will he stay or will he go? Donald Trump kicked off his party's convention by joking that he might stay not four, but even 12 more years. It came as no surprise that the convention nominated the president for a second term. More unexpected was the dark mood at a meeting that had been billed as sending a message of hope and optimism. Instead, Trump sharply attacked his rival Joe Biden and accused the Democrats of scheming to manipulate mail-in ballots. Biden himself says he will be an ally of the light, not the darkness. Trump versus Biden, a dirty fight for the U.S. presidency? That's our title. Welcome to To The Point. It is a pleasure to introduce our guests. Suda David Wilp is Deputy Director of the Berlin Office of the Transatlantic Think Tank German Marshall Fund. And she says American elections are always full of dirty campaign tricks. But this year, the rhetoric will be harsher than ever. And it's a pleasure to welcome Ralph Freund. He is a political lobbyist with Republicans overseas. And his opinion, the track record of both candidates doesn't lie. And in the long run, quality always succeeds. Therefore, Trump will prevail. And great to have with us once again, Soraya Sahadi Nelson. She is the program director of the English speaking radio station KCRW Berlin. And she says the Republican National Convention this week shows how damaged the Trump presidency is. Many prominent Republicans didn't even take part. So let me ask uh, you, Suda, you say American election campaigns are always dirty. So was there anything about these two party conventions that actually surprised you? No, I think it's to be expected, but given the, um, you know, how strong polarization is in the United States at the moment, certainly there's always um, dirty campaign tricks over, you know, in, in U.S. election history. But I think this time it's two parties pitted against each other, framing each other as sort of enemies for the United States or an existential threat for the United States. And that's why it's especially harsh. And that mood of darkness that we heard, particularly on the first night of the Republican convention, nothing there that really stood out for you as particularly uh, harsh? Well, I think, you know, um, President Trump in 2016, we saw this, and also during the 2018 midterm elections, his um, mantra for winning elections is like, let's play fear. Let's use fear as a way of winning. And um, the question is of whether it'll work in 2020. Well, friend, the Republicans had promised an upbeat convention, but in fact, they largely delivered the opposite. What's the message behind that? Well, the message behind the convention was that um, he has a strong team, he has a strong family, he has um, a, a message which he's transported, and he has a track record, of course. The track record is eco economically until um, um, Corona was quite successful. And I think he's going to play the card that he's the leader, that he's a good eco economical leader. And I think we'll see in the future, you know, in the next eight to ten weeks, whether we get a more a, 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 a campaign towards more economical issues or more liberal rights issues. Suda mentioned uh, the fear element. In fact, we've heard a lot of speakers at the convention saying the president is the only one who can really protect uh, Americans and keep them secure. But the fact is that the chaos we're seeing right now in the United States has occurred on his watch. Well, the point... But the question is, is he responsible for, for parts of the chaos? I mean, he, the management from Corona, for instance, it's not within his responsibility. It's, it, it's on the um, uh, individual states. Um, the point is, he's responsible for, for, for the economy, yes, but he's not responsible for, for this liberal rights discussion. I think, I think it's, it's be very, very, you have to be very cautious who is responsible for such problems. Maybe we've, we've been talking about this for more than 10, 20 years now, that there are um, problems, and we had the and we had the Obama Biden administration, and they haven't been doing um, uh, much against that as well. Soraya, you talked about prominent Republicans uh, not taking part in the Republican convention. In fact, a number of them took part in the Democratic one, warning voters not to vote for Donald Trump once again. My question to you would be though. How many people are really getting that message? Will it change support for Donald Trump? Because if you look at the numbers, it seems that at most 30% of American voters have been watching these conventions. 
Uh, that's true. Um, but on the other hand, and, and there's no doubt that there's, you're talking about a base that's going to stay with Donald Trump and it's going to be very difficult to move them. But there is also that large, I mean, there are Republicans who perhaps yearn for a different time or a party. I mean, this party has been redefined at this point to be uh, a Trump loyalist party. I mean, and the, and the people who are not showing up, uh, you know, that, that that's because they just refuse to follow that line. And so I think that there are a large number of voters out there that could deviate. I mean, that could go in another direction uh, to somebody like Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, uh, because it's just, it, it's more moderate. And, and so there, there, is a, there is a large component there that is not being addressed by this very you know, narrow definition that we've seen or that we're seeing. Ralph, let me ask you something about this Trump loyalist party. In fact, this convention, the Republican convention has been absolutely dominated by the president's family. Absolutely. The party forewent for having a program, a platform, that's a historic first. It seems like the platform is Donald Trump. Has the Republican Party become, in fact, a personality cult? Well, not personality cult, but Trump finally now, compared to last election, has a track record. You know, don't forget he was not a politician before he went into office, and he was a he, he was a businessman. Now he has a four years, you know, track record, and now he can claim what I have been doing the last four years, and basically I've kept a lot of promises, and and he's playing that card very well, I believe. Let's uh, hear from the president uh, himself. I'll come right back to you, Soraya. I see you want to respond. But let, let us first hear from the president himself. He has been claiming for some time now that the only way he could lose would be if the election is rigged. And as the Republican convention got underway, he spelled out how he thought that might happen. Because we caught them doing some really bad things. In 2016, let's see what happens. We caught them doing some really bad things. We have to be very careful because they're trying it again with this whole 80 million mail-in ballots that they're working on, uh, sending them out to people that didn't ask for them. They didn't ask, they just get them. And the only way they can take this election away from us is if this is a rigged election. We're going to win this election. We're going to win this election. So, Soraya, I know you wanted to respond just now to Ralph, but perhaps you can also tell us, what's the president doing there? Uh, well, he's doing what he does, uh, does very well, which is uh, sort of elevate the fear factor and basically say, uh, this is the Trump reality. There's no way he could lose unless this is a rigged election. And there are a lot of people who believe that. So that is a card he's playing, even though uh, it may come back to haunt him. <laughs> you know, we'll have to see how that goes. I was just going to say, though, about the loyalist thing. I mean, I think it's what Trump has, has established is not just a record, but he really has been uh, much more about who says what. I mean, he, he's fired people for not being 100% loyal to him. Anybody who questions him or questions his policy is gone. I mean, the people who are left at the White House right now are uh, diehard Trump supporters and, and loyalists who will, even to the point of uh, the medical uh, people who are advising him in the pandemic, you know, it's it's like my way or the highway. So to me, I, I don't know, I, I don't, I find that to be new. I don't think this is just an incumbent president having, uh, you know, his supporters sort of rallying around him for a second term. So to, what do you make of the fact that the president is saying he can't lose the election unless it's rigged? What are the implications of that? Well, it sounds like he's setting things up so that if he is to lose, he can say, point the vigor and say, look, it's unfair, and he can still sort of hold clout outside of office. So he can still sort of be an agitator outside the White House. But the irony actually is that, um, you know, recently there was a bipartisan report released from the U.S. Senate. Both Republicans and Democrats said that in 2016, the Russians did interfere in the U.S. elections. Mm. And that's kind of ironic, actually, that he's saying that because there, there has been um, a bipartisan report saying there was Russian interference and there was collusion, but there was no evidence to convict. Ralph, in a climate as yes. polarized and heated right. as the one that we have in the U.S. right now, aren't words like that that essentially throw doubt, skepticism on the entire democratic process, the very core of that process, an election, aren't they playing with fire? 
Absolutely, and on that point, I have a different opinion. I think it's inappropriate for a president to say that, like stuff like that. Also, he claimed four years ago he's he's going to throw um, Hillary Clinton into prison. I thought that wasn't appropriate either. So I think there's a red line, and the president shouldn't pass this line um, not too often. Do you think there's a real chance that if the results of the election are indeterminate, mm -hmm. those mail-in ballots they may take weeks to count? Right. Is there a real chance? that he would contest an election result? I have no idea. It's like the first time in history that, that that would happen. I, at this point, I don't have the fantasy to go that far. I don't think that's going to happen. So, Ray, I talked about playing with fire. We have seen President Trump discredit democratic institutions again and again. What are the systemic consequences of that? Well, I mean, he still is playing to a populace that wants to see things shaken up. Um, I think that the lines have become so blurred as to what perhaps could use reform versus uh, institutions that we stand by that I, I think this is something that's going to be very hard for whoever is the next president to kind of heal. Um, I think that people are going to continue to react with emotion and and with, uh, you know, t defend their positions without facts necessarily. And that's that's still sort of... I think the mantra that sort of has become, you know, America, and it's it's very dangerous. I think it's it's dangerous, as you mentioned, for democratic institutions. Um, you know, we we have yet to see uh, what will happen with with the election. You know, postal service. You know, you name it. There are just things that are that are crumbling, um, and that people don't really understand what what the damage could be if that continues. Let's uh, perhaps dig a bit deeper on that dark mood that we have seen at the Republican convention and maybe also tie it to some of the events uh, in Kenosha, Wisconsin this week. Numerous speakers have stoked fear and anger at the Republican meeting with predictions of mob violence in the streets. And one of those who fanned the flames was the president's son, Donald Trump Jr., in a speech that many observers saw as a launching pad for his own political ambitions. People of faith are under attack. You're not allowed to go to church, but mass chaos in the streets gets a pass. It's almost like this election is shaping up to be church, work, and school versus rioting, looting, and vandalism. So let us now go to Suda. Um, and Suda, on the same evening that Donald Trump Jr. spoke, we heard a very striking uh, appearance by a couple named McCloskey. Mm -hmm. The McCloskeys had been charged with a felony for pointing their weapons at black protesters who were going through their streets. Are the Republicans with a statement like that, with statements like we just heard from Donald Trump Jr., are they indirectly, if not directly, exploiting racism? Well, I think it's become sort of a party of grievance. And, you know, there are, of course, in 2016, I think Donald Trump was very smart to see that there were parts of the U.S. electorate that were still suffering and people feeling left behind. The question now is, where does the lines cross, as we've often talked about, how Donald Trump breaks norms and crosses certain lines where it becomes taking advantage of people with fear and also actually harming them because you're stoking division. And what um, Donald Trump Jr. is um, describing in a world according to Biden is actually happening now under Donald Trump's watch. So I hope, getting back to your question also about the results of the election, I hope that there's a resounding win for either side because then I think that the country can sort of move on and, and not have this sort of neck and neck um, division of, um, you know, po and polarization. We need to have um, some constructive work moving forward. Mm -hmm. Ralph Freund from Republicans Abroad. Sorry, I think I got that name wrong at yeah. the uh, outset of the show. In Kenosha, Wisconsin, uh, those divisions have been on display this week. On Tuesday right. night, we saw armed civilians get into a scuffle with protesters while they were trying, while the armed uh, civilians were trying to guard a car dealership. Two people were killed. Isn't your party, the Republican Party, playing with fire when it's instrumentalizing racial resentment and fear 
of mob violence in a way like what we have seen this week? Well, the point is, you, I, I'm a man of law and order, and the president is as well. The point is, how far do you go, actually, right? I think if we have, um, if at this point, um, we don't get um, peace on the streets, you, you, you need a strong, a strong administration, I believe. But there's a certain point, a red line, where this is crossed and where, where where there um, also racism is involved. So I, I, I believe we, we should really, as you said, we should really like like come down a little bit and, and, and watch it from a, as, um, after a perspective. After, after. I have to say, I asked myself yes. when I saw the events in Kenosha on Tuesday night, to what degree the appearance of charged people charged with a felony on the first night of the convention incites people like these armed uh, civilians in Kenosha to take to the streets. So, me as a German, the whole situation is, is awkward. I mean, absolutely. I mean, we're, we're talking about gun laws and we're talking about um, um, scenarios which we will never have in this country. So at this point, I'm, I'm a very modest person. I would never agree to that. I mean, President Trump, we have to say, has certainly um, played, um, you know, he's very, he's sort of stoking the flames of white nationalism in yeah. the United States. Yeah. And his own um, assistant secretary for counterterrorism at Homeland Security just came out with a video. She's a former official and said that President Trump is doing that. And you you saw what happened with the synagogue um, in 2018. You saw the white nationalists in Charlottesville and the Republican Party and um, also Donald Trump have to vehemently reject those ideas of having any place in the Republican Party. Right. Soraya, much of this is aimed at white suburban voters. There's been a lot of talk about the suburbs and the McCloskeys, of course, uh, are the incarnation of those white suburban dwellers. Not coincidentally, because it is precisely white suburban residents who have been deserting uh, the Republicans for the Democrats, particularly in the midterm elections in 2018. Do you think that this kind of talk that we're seeing would win them back to the Republican Party? Uh, I don't think so, and I don't think the McClos McCloskeys really represent um, white suburban voters, or at least the white suburban voters that I know or that, <laughs> I, that I would associate with. I mean, I honestly do think um, right. that people, uh, you know, they want it toned down. I don't think that this, this. I mean, I, I don't think it helps when you have downtowns on fire and, you know, if w for the people who are violently protesting. I think it unfortunately negates uh, you know, a, to a large extent, the peaceful protest that you see. And, and that is a danger. But I just, I don't see that message or those sorts of people, um, you know, somehow swaying the, the suburban voters. Unless, and, and there's a big unless, if the fear factor somehow takes hold again, if, if the disgust and the frustration and that it's time for something new is replaced by that fear factor again. Let's just uh, give a quick listen to Donald Trump's base. All of you have pointed out that he seems to be playing to his base, and they seem prepared to stick by him. I think he's doing his best. I know he loves this country, and I, and I uh, think he has his best, the best interests in heart. I've been so happy with him from day one. Um, what is it that you like about him? <laughs> just the fact that he's uh, trying to live a Christian life. The Democrats have become socialist communists, and all they want is destruction. Antifa and, and the Black Lives Matter movement, a terrorist organization very much similar to Hitler's brown shirts. Suda, as the Democrats have repeatedly pointed out at their party convention, the Trump administration has perhaps the worst record on corona management of any country and certainly of any industrialized country. Why wouldn't that matter to Trump's base? Yeah, I think the Republican Party is just as split as the Democratic Party. And the voices that we just heard from are, you know, certainly one extreme wing of the party, but they're also interested in social issues. So, you know, the question of abortion, um, the question of sort of religious freedom for Christians, those things play a larger role and they ignore the distasteful tweets. They ignore the fact that President Trump has cut taxes for the, you know, 1% in the United States and not necessarily help working class um, white people in the United States and is also trying to strip away 
away um, Obamacare, right? And also that hurts people with pre-existing conditions. So there's a lot of um, hypocrisy, but I think that they believe that he's delivered for them on the social issues, on the so-called culture wars. Mm -hmm. Ralph Freund, can President Trump win by appealing to his base alone? Well, he did last time because, um, um, as I said um, a couple of times before, um, Donald Trump is also the outcome of the administration, Obama and Biden, and a lot of Democrats were dissatisfied with, with their, um, actually what they claimed and finally fulfilled. So, um, yes, it, it worked last time, and probably the mobilization of the Republican Party is usually higher than of the Democratic Party, but the Democratic Party have probably in the sum more voters. So it's going to be very interesting to, to see um, if, if, if um, President um, Trump is able to mobilize his voters. What do you think, Soraya? A campaign based on fear, on anger, on indirect, if not direct, racism? Really? Do you think it can, can win? Um, I think maybe we'll see some Republican voters staying home this time if they can't stomach voting for the for the Democrats. Right. But I, um, I also think that the Democrats don't have it in the bag with their own voters. I mean, there is... Uh, what, who is a Democratic voter these days? You know, the progressives certainly f are feeling left out of this particular race. Um, and I, there wasn't much outreach during, or at least it didn't feel like there was much outreach during the uh, Democratic convention. So that has to change in, in the coming weeks. Okay, super quick listen to uh, one of the speeches at the Democratic convention, namely Biden's acceptance speech. I'll be an ally of the light, not the darkness. Joe Biden promises the USA a better future. His words were underscored by big emotions, despite the fact that the Democratic National Convention took place online. The current president has cloaked American darkness for much too long. Too much anger, too much fear, too much division. Here and now, I give you my word. If you entrust me with the presidency, I will draw on the best of us, not the worst. I'll be an ally of the light, not the darkness. As a man of the people and crisis manager, Joe Biden wants to heal the USA, which has been hit hard by economic and societal turmoil. At his side is Kamala Harris, and as his vice president, she intends to help him win the White House. We must elect a president who will bring something different, something better, and do the important work. A president who will bring all of us together, black, white, Latino, Asian, indigenous, to achieve the future we collectively want. We must elect Joe Biden. But the Democrats haven't offered many concrete strategies about how they plan to overhaul the country. Is not being Donald Trump enough for them to win? Suda, can the Democrats really go high when the Republicans go low? Or do they have to resort to dirty tricks as well to win? Well, I mean, I think the uh, never Trumpers are being dirty for them so they can let, you know, um, the Lincoln Project, for example, go low for the Democrats. But at the end of the day, I actually don't think um, Vice President Biden is a necessarily a different candidate, but he's back to some sort of normalcy, back to, um, you know, an America that had um, stability. But that may not be enough in the long run. And that's why I do think that Vice President Biden, if he does win, is sort of an interim solution for the Democrats. Soraya, unlike the Republicans, the Democrats do have a party program, and it actually does incorporate some pretty progressive issues and suggestions, including strengthening unions, for example. Um, is that enough to get the kind of broad mobilization the Democrats are going to need? I think that he and or also Kamala, they'll need to reach out more. Uh, they have, especially because the primary showed, you know, where the divisions lie. And I think that there needs to be more outreach. I mean, that that to me is what I hear from younger people like my son. Key segment of the voters will be black Americans, Ralph Ryan. Both parties are striving to mobilize them. We've seen a very powerful speech by a black senator at the Republican right. convention. Who's more likely to garner their votes? 
probably even to, towards the Democrats, but the, his, the argument four years ago from Donald Trump was, what do you as a black voter have to lose if you vote a Republican? I mean, um, the track record um, from towards the black um, voters um, eight years ago um, and four years ago and more wasn't that successful either. So, so what do they have to lose? Let me ask all of you to say in one word whether you agree or disagree with Michelle Obama when she said, believe me, things can and will get worse if Donald Trump is elected. Let me ask you this. Are they going to get worse in the next two months? Suda? I mean, I agree simply. Oh, one word, I agree. Or do I, can I elaborate? I mean, the adults in the room are gone. It's a different type. It'll be a Donald Trump administration um, unplugged. Soraya, now and after the election, get worse? Uh, yeah, I think that's the direction it's headed. I'll say we, we're going to stay in a very successful economical line. Okay, many thanks to all of you for those brief last answers and for this very, very interesting discussion. And thanks to everybody out there for tuning in. See you soon.